thanks very much. Um, for those of you who know my father, he's actually very unwell at the moment. He has uh, metastatic prostate cancer, and uh, and uh, so I actually didn't think I'd be here, but um, I am, and he's doing okay at the moment. So um, thanks to the people who ran the conference for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. It's a real honour. So I've been charged with trying to prove or disprove that air is cost effective. I thought what I might do, you've all seen this slide before, but I thought I might do this by talking about four things. First of all, talk a little bit about our own early experience and where we did a cost benefit analysis. Secondly, um, look at the international literature. Uh, thirdly, um, uh, sorry, secondly, I'm going to look at um, the international literature on, on complications and so on. Thirdly, look at the international literature as there is on um, cost benefit. And then finally, talk about uh, a way we, in which we might address some of the problems that have been raised by that literature. So we're all familiar with this diagram as we've gone on and, and uh, so ERAS is not, uh, none of these things are particularly expensive which is nice, other, unlike robots. Um, our, what I thought I'd do is just go through our program and talk about uh, how, what we've found with complications and um, cost benefits. So this is what our program looks like. We start off with patient information at the clinic. We get our patients to go on a ward visit. Uh, we then give carbohydrate drinks and we we'll give the person uh, four the night before if they're having bowel prep for a rectal operation and just two on the morning of surgery if they're having colonic surgery. We don't use mechanical bowel preparation uh, except for rectal surgery um, and we use an enema of the morning of surgery for left-sided cases. We admit all of our patients who are having colonic surgery on the morning of surgery but we're, I understand, pretty old-fashioned because we admit our rectal cases the night before. Uh, we use thoracic epidural analgesia. Uh, we, we're uh, not entirely sold on the laparoscope yet, and that's changing as we've got more junior and um, trained in laparoscopic surgeons, but we tend to use transverse incisions for our right-sided cases and midline or laparoscopic for our left side. I know Robin's appalled by this. We uh, avoid drains and azogastric tubes. Um, as I talked about in the presentation I made earlier, we limit our intraoperative fluid therapy. Uh, the goals we use aren't, aren't guided by the Doppler. Um, they're guided by um, urine output, blood pressure, and pulse, etc. We cease the IV fluids when the person gets to the ward. And we use pressors for epidural hypertension. And we're very fortunate in that our unit has a, a small HDU just on the ward, so we're able to move patients across for that. I know not everybody has that, and not everybody also manages epidural hypertension in an HDU. We preemptively are quite aggressive for their antiemetics. Patients are sat up on the ward and drink. We use resource or 40 sip, it doesn't really matter, which I don't, don't think, but we will give those to patients. Uh, day one, remove the catheter in the morning, and for most nurses around the world, that's pretty radical because an epidural is still in place, but you can do it. Uh, patients are mobilised um, during that day. We resume normal diet. Oral analgesia has started. We are still using non steroidal anti inflammatories, but we're wondering about that. Uh, day two, we stop the epidural infusion in the morning and then remove in the afternoon. We do that around the clexane dosing. Uh, my, we've had a little bit of debate in our unit about this. I personally aim to discharge at day three. Um, my colleagues are a bit happier at day four or five. I'm not sure it's that important, but whatever it is, you need to make sure that we make sure that that's clear at the time of uh, the time the patients are seen before surgery. I, I think day of discharge is, is really overrated, but anyway, it's, it's something that we do. But I do think if you're going to have a day of discharge, people need to know what it is. Um, we have quite clear discharge criteria and they don't involve moving a bowel motion. Um, and we need to make sure adequate home support's in place. So just as uh, the previous speaker did, we took our first 50 patients in this in this study and to try to, at first 50 patients after we'd been to Vidor Hospital and I don't know if daughter's in the audience but special thanks to her for looking after us so well when we went to Vidor Hospital. Um, but we went there and we, we came back and wrote our protocols and our first 50 patients are in this ERAS group here and then we took an age and sex and operation match group and that's our control group from previously. As you can see we had the expected benefits and there were decreases in the amount of IV fluids we used. Um, we already were quite into our epidurals so we, while we increased them a little bit, um, we actually decreased the time we used them. Uh, patients ate earlier, passed flatus earlier 
and um, were independently mobile earlier. And then, as you can see, we cut down the number of patients quite remark markedly um, who were admitted the day before surgery. The amount of time in hospital was decreased from already quite respectable six and a half days to four days, but it was even better than that because total hospital stay, including readmissions, went down. Is this feedbacking this thing? Is it just me that I can hear it? Okay. Um, our total hospital stay, including readmissions, was um, was four in the ERAS group, and but remained at, was at eight in the control group. Readmissions, I think, are a thing that people make a lot of noise about. I actually think there's a lot of things you can do about readmissions, but they are, I think, they're related to a hospital. And we have a rather poor population in South Auckland, and so this is our readmission rate. It didn't change or it didn't get worse with this um, with this program. What, uh, what, what uh, was important, and this also bears, um, uh, is also very relevant to the cost issue, and that was that complications went down. So while the number of patients with a complication of any kind didn't change, and we used the Clavian Dindo and we included absolutely everything you could imagine from one to five, uh, deaths, if anything, decreased, although you know, they weren't statistically significant. But most importantly, you can see the ileus became a rare problem. Um, Urinary tract infections went down massively in Europe but without going up in urinary retention. And also cardiopulmonary complications were halved. Now, cost studies don't take into any benefit, don't take into account this kind of stuff. And this is actually the time after surgery. So people go home at day four, five, six, or whatever it might be. But there's still a lot of recovery to go on. As you can see, this is post-operative fatigue. And this group of patients who went through our ERAS program, as I mentioned, this is largely an open group. Um, as you can see, they're very blunted post-operative fatigue. So uh, instead of it going way up uh, as it did previously, it actually went down a lot. And in fact, you, this tracks with a laparoscopic group that we did later on. So here we come, now I get to the cost thing. So I don't actually believe these figures, but these were the figures given to us by the accountants in the hospital, and they're a pretty hard bunch. But the, the um, this, this 102,000 102, New Zealand dollars, which is about seven Swiss francs, um, uh, but anyway, it's not, a lot, it's not as much. Uh, New Zealand dollar tracks about 80 cents um, to the US do dollar. <coughs> um, this $102,000 included the, the salary of a research fellow who ran the program for that year and also included, or, or less than a year at a time that um, we did the study, it also included the all expenses fancy trip to um, Denmark for three days. Um, that was a long trip for a very short period of time. And then you subtracted the amount that, um, we, th that it cost these people and you end up with this divided by 50, this remarkably large figure. So if nothing else, it doesn't cost money to do an ERAS program. And you'd kind of expect that because this is a meta-analysis that's been done previously and was talked about in the last talk. But as you can see, the length of hospital stay go down and we know that hospitals cost a lot of money to spend time in, so you'd expect there to be savings. The complication rate is roughly halved uh, as, and so you'd expect that to save money. And the death rate, um, sorry, the readmission rate isn't increased in any studies that I've seen. So you'd expect that wouldn't cost you any extra money. And the death rate is not changed of anything. It might be slightly improved. So you'd expect there to be some kind of financial benefit from, from ERAS programs. Just makes sense. So we went and did a systematic literature review, which we haven't written up yet or published. So it does include the ERAS Society meeting. So I went around the posters yesterday, and I found Dr. Ruan's poster. And I thought, I'd better include that, because he'll make a noise about it and ask me a difficult question. So I've included his 1900 Swiss franc per patient saving. And uh, we can, these were studies that included ERAS versus standard or conventional or whatever care. Uh, we just did ones in colorectal surgery. There are 10 relevant studies, but a couple of these were just relatively early, small studies evaluating pathways. And here's the eight that remain. As you can see, um, almost all of them are retrospective studies. There are two randomized control studies, one earlier this year by Ren uh, in the World Journal of Surgery from China, which showed quite significant cost savings. And um, the LAFA study, disappointingly, didn't show any difference in costs. Interestingly, it showed that university hospitals are more expensive than other hospitals, and I wasn't quite sure how to interpret that, and I'd be interested to talk to anybody who could explain that to me. 
but the retrospective studies in broad terms all show that there are actually a difference. Now, going back to the slide that was put up of Don Buick from Gemma, um, it may be that the randomized controlled trial doesn't actually pick up these things. And so we tested this. Um, uh, we tested this, uh, this, this issue of uh, selection bias and difficulty with blinding in a study in bariatrics, which is a subject of a poster out there, and it wasn't given to me as a, po a podium presentation, so I'm giving it to you as a podium presentation right now. So uh, what we aim to do is uh, compare ERAS versus conventional care and laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, which is an operation done for um, obese patients trying to lose weight. And this was the thing we were, one of the things we tried to address in this study, and that's the point of this, this particular aspect of the presentation. It's imp almost impossible to blind patients to an ERAS intervention um, or, or to their carers. And this gives you the possibility of crossover between the groups, which I think is the enemy of these kind of randomized controlled trials, looking at um, complications and also looking at um, issues of cost. So what we did is we introduced a historical control group, and somebody talked about this the other yesterday, about propensity scoring. It's actually uh, the study, the study that was mentioned before, uh, not my study, but the one in the last talk talked about matching the last 50 patients. That's one way of doing it. That has issues. You can then do what we did, which is age six and operation match the patients. That also has possibilities of bias. Propensity scoring, you take everything you can think of that you can get the data on and then you use that to match patients, so you, that's the way it works. So it's actually quite a neat way of doing things. It's sort of a, a randomized control trial without the problem of crossover. So we had the group like that to help us to try to get rid of the crossover problem. Well, the primary endpoint was length of hospital stay. So our particular hospital stay at the time was three days. We wanted to get it down to one. And remember this is, you can call it a sleeve gastrectomy like, but it's a gastrectomy. It's a, quite a significant operation with a very long suture line. It's a proper operation. And this led us to um, require a sample size of 38 of each arm. And as I said, we had propensity match cohort, historical cohort. And this is the way things looked. So we assessed 152 patients for a variety of reasons. A few patients didn't want, didn't want to be in the study or weren't eligible, randomized them, 53 to 53. There were some problems with people getting operated on a different site. The hospital was ex exporting some operations to another site, so they weren't able to be involved ended up 40, 38, and then we took our historical cohort of 400 patients. We've got a government-funded program, and then we took the ones that most match these patients, and we got 38 of them. If you look at the baseline characteristics, as you'd expect with the randomization, things look pretty even, and then as you expect with the historical cohort, the propensity matched. Again, we got very things very even. Uh, this was a group, uh, interesting group of patients with Maori and Pacific patients, a huge problem with obesity in our Maori and Pacific patients in New Zealand. Unfortunately, there weren't as many of them in the study as we would have liked, but that's a number of issues. But um, uh, you can see this, this is a group of patients who are not just standard people who are just a little bit fat, and you can see that um, they are very, very big, um, carrying around a couple of nurses on their tummies um, with very high BMIs. In fact, a significant number of super obese. And this was the sort of group we had, two thirds of them roughly with diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, et cetera. So if you just take out the historical cohort, just forget about that for the moment, and you look at, we actually did achieve our, our day stay of one day, but we went down to two days with our group who were in the uh, non-ERAS arm whereas historically it had been three days. Our readmit rate, we were kind of discouraged by this until we realized this was just our endogenous readmit rate for our hospital. Um, and then if you look at our total length of stay, this included readmissions, it was one, two versus three. So this suggests that the real benefit actually between this and this group, as opposed to between this and this group, and it could give an argument for why um, randomized controlled trials in ERAS are a bit of a problem. If you look at complications, and remember the study wasn't powered for this, but and I haven't done the stats on this, but this was total complications, and we were, you know, well decreased, but it looks like a solid trend towards a decrease in total complications. And here goes the, the nub of the problem. So these were a series of um, points that we took for our ERAS compliance, and you can see that a number of patients were given a big slug of dexamethasone, which we know takes a day off um, in colorectal surgery if you day stay just straight up. Um, we're quite pleased with our um, Klexane use. But look here, they got mobilized early. 
They had their catheters taken out early, no nasogastric tubes, because we used a lot of nasogastric tubes previously. The drains, there were no drains in a lot more of the patients and so on, so there was a, a significant overlap. And when we looked at these figures initially for cost benefit, we were a bit disappointed because we only seemed to save about $700 per patient, which is roughly the day stay. But if you look back at the, at the historical group and just note this very large standard deviation, which suggests these differences aren't as big as this, but look at the difference now. So there are much bigger differences, which helps to explain why the retrospective studies have shown the bigger differences than the randomized control trials. So in summary, I'm actually convinced that URAS saves money. Um, I think that difficulties with blinding and compliance and crossover may well have hidden the true savings in previous studies. And I think using well-matched historical comparisons, and we need to be clever about this than we've been, I think propensity scoring is the way to go, may be of use in comparing non-ERAS versus ERAS and other interventions, such interventions in the future. Thanks very much. <laughs>